thanks. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm going to go through how I came to work in the game industry, uh, a bit about how I set up my company, and um, second half will be about making Illumino City. So I'm co-founder of Indie Game Studio based in South London. We self-publish our games and all include in some way um, combining real world with digital. Also, lately, all our games have been point and click puzzle adventures. So I'm first going to talk about my first love of games. And this was it. <laughs> this was Galactic Plague, which I played with my, bro my little brother for hours and hours, beating him every time. And it's really funny, I was, um, when I was putting this slide together, I was like, oh yeah, Galactic Plague, you know, that was amazing, fantastic graphics, we played it for hours, and then I Googled the Googled image of it, I was like, is that it, is that it, took up all our time, but, you know, that was, that was a really fantastic time, just beating my little brother. Um, another game that was really important to me was Day of the Tentacle. This was a point-and-click adventure game, and I think this is, like, directly influences what I make now. It was a fant fantastic game. I learned so much about American history. Um, it was the first to really, like, the interaction was really good. You know, this was a fantastic graphics for when it came out. So I had, you know, all through, you know, my, my, my youth up until I was a teenager, you know, I was playing lots of games. Um, and then as a teenager, I kind of went off them. I'm not sure whether it was just sort of like the time, you know, early 90s, not, not so many good games, but... My passion was art, and that's what really, you know, took me at this point in my life, and really, I really ran with it. And I just want to say at this point, like, um, big up to art teachers, because it's a time at the moment where they're being told their subject isn't very important, but, you know, I was using digital cameras in the late 90s, you know, with my... My GCSE art teacher managed to get us one to use for like five minutes each, and it was about this big, and you had to hold it. And we still only did blurry photos of, of roses, but you know he get he allowed us to have that and have that experience. And then I was then um, manipulating digital images, and you know so digital and art from really like as soon as the technology was available to me, I was using it. My, my was scanning oil paints with my dad's scanner and sort of getting told off because obviously oil paints don't dry, dry for ages. So, you know, I was really kind of, you know, that's where my passion went. So that took me to do a degree in new media production. Um, that sounds quite, you know, dated now, but it was, a, you know, we were doing, again, digital. And I wasn't really, you know, if someone said to me in my first year at uni, oh, you'll be making games, what do you think of the games industry? I just... I couldn't really see myself there, but all my output from that time were games. So it was a natural sort of way for me to, to get across an interactive narrative. Um, this was well, one of my final projects, and even then, you know, we used rotoscope techniques and things like that. But even then, um, you know, we're using, I'm using handmade backgrounds and things like that, scanning in things again. So, you know, I graduated from then, so surely the games industry. I'm making mini games, I'm making flash games, all my output was games, but my first love, again, was, was coming through, and I ended up working at Tate Britain. Um, I did this, this was an internship that I did in the summer, and then when I moved to London, they offered me a full-time job. This was, again, I was digital designer for the, for the website, so... Um, Combining digital and art is kind of a natural way for me. And then surely that was my big break then. But then I worked for QVC, the shopping channel. <laughs> I love this picture because Gordon Ramsay just really doesn't want to be there. Um, so I was a digital designer then. And again, equally fantastic as working for the Tate in terms of what I learned, like about fast, you know, fast turnarounds of things and doing just things really quickly, getting it done, working to deadlines, all of these things that really you know, pave the way for what, what working in the games industry is. But, you know, it's, you don't really realise this at the time. Then I was kind of doing... Me and my um, business partner, Luke, we were kind of doing... When we first set up the company, we kind of... We were doing interactive mini-games. Um, so this is one of them. It was for Miniclip. And again, it's, they, they commissioned us to do a football game, but we were like, we'll get watercolours in this somewhere. <laughs> Did watercolour backgrounds and all this. So again, this love of like art and handmadeness was coming through really early on. 
We then did um, some animations, Christian Aid, out in Sierra Leone, which was again using like mixed media and like just pushing what what we could do. And it wasn't a conscious decision. It wasn't like oh we'll be the handmade people. It was just a kind of for us the most natural way to start with anything was with a sketchbook, um, and that kind of led to this kind of handmade look just being part of what State of Play was. We then launched a game called. Um, has been storybook on the iPad in 2011, and um, this wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't real set or anything like we're doing now, but it is, um, it is made to look like that. And it was almost at this point we were like, we're, we're really trying to make things look real. Why don't, you know, we just try and do a real thing and maybe do something with that? And then I think this was the kind of eureka moment for us when we. When we, you know, we we just messing about on a Tuesday in the studio, um, thinking, you know, why don't we film a character running, running across the city? And although this is really rushed, it took us like an hour or whatever. Um, there was just something about it that sparked something, and you, you know, all the lighting you're getting with her is for free. All the, you know, all the shadows in the buildings. There's just something really natural and organic about it that we really loved. This led us to our first um, completely handmade game, Loom. Here's a screenshot for it. We launched this in 2012, I think. Um, again, so everything there on screen you, is made by hand that we then videoed, apart from the character, which we animated over the top. So people are often ask us, why do we make games in this way? But often when we're in the middle of production, it's, oh, why? Um, making things by hand helps to break down the wall between intention and final artwork. In other words, as an artist, you get a more immediate and true representation of your ideas. What I mean to say is, as a viewer, you can more easily see the intention of the artist. That is, the work feels more human. I mean, it's got soul. And that it's got soul is something that we are always looking for in the games we make. And I think, as a creative person, that's hopefully what you're always trying to strive to do. Um, if you want to tell a story and get ideas across, why better, what better way to make people care about them than what better way than to make people care about them? And that's really important. If, you're, if your players love it and can see that, that magic that you're trying to portray, they're going like, to follow your games and keep playing your games and love what you do. Where that some of this wasn't even clear to me at the time must also be we like making things. It sounded impossible, and it seemed like fun. And this, it sounded impossible. It's really crucial for us. You know, if if someone said to me, "You're going to spend three to four years making a game out of cardboard and glue and wood," I'd be like, "Nah, we're not going to do that." But we did, and it and it you know every day we we loved doing what we did. And also, you know, this idea of we didn't, we didn't, you know, we didn't like mess about with the unity thing or, you know, we just, the, the idea and the core of what we wanted to tell, the story we wanted to tell, got us to where we, where we are, not the use of the tools. Um, so we really wanted to, you know, just keep it authentic and do what we wanted to do. So this was Loom. This was the size of Loom. This is about metre by metre, filmed in... Um, a friend's front door. So we launched Loom, you know, as a real kind of proof of concept for this kind of game. We didn't really know what we were doing, but equally we didn't want to spend too much time, um, you know, too much, invest too much time in making this um, point and click adventure game when we didn't even know whether people wanted to play it. So Loom was a kind of a prequel to Lumino City, and um, you know, for us it worked really well. So the scale of this, like I said, is about a meter by a meter. And this was Lumino City, so we upscaled lots. But luckily, you know, we, Loom sold, did well for us, sold well, which meant we could go into production with Lumino City. So I'm just going to go through some of the techniques we used with Lumino City. Oh, sorry, designing the city. Um, so this was um, a sketch we had way back when we started making production on Loom. Um, and this is how kind of roughly the final layout looked. So it kind of, we just kind of spread it out slightly. 
Um, I'm just going to talk quickly about collaboration. We were in a cafe and we looked up and we saw this picture. And this is Katrina. And we hadn't met her. We didn't know her. Um, but we realised that she was thinking along the same lines as us. We hadn't released that picture, so there's no, no way she could copy us. And we just thought, we've got to get in touch with this person. You know, everything's so similar. Um, the ideas um, that were coming from this really stood out. So we had this really... She was um, an architect student, so completely unrelated to games, completely, you know, even really a creative process like the way we make things was unknown to her. But what she brought with us was so many techniques that we hadn't used before and so many ideas that, as you know, we just opened us up creatively so much. Um, I'll just quickly go through some of the sketches for Luminosity. Again, you know, it's really, we spent lots of time doing this and really put many hours in making sure we knew what we wanted to do. And that's uh, one of the final gatehouse designs. This was great as well because the, all these were stuck on with blue tacks so we can move them around and stuff, and things like that. So we had this process of sketching and then we made a wireframe. We wanted to prove that, and uh, we did, we wanted to, prove the idea because once we made the models we knew we couldn't go back and and start and start again so we did a really really basic wireframe this is you know ridiculously basic just black and white in flash and and this is how that scene looks in the final game and you can see obviously it looks a lot different but the mechanics aren't particularly you know there's not a lot of difference between those two um, so once we had a a prototype that worked perfectly, we could then start model making. So I'm just run through quickly the gatehouse. Gatehouse is the first scene you come to in the game. This started as sketches, um, then cardboard sketches that Katrina did. These were great. She could do these in like the time it took us to draw things. So um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so that again, you know, we could we could make this quickly, photograph it. Make, out, make sure you could see Lumi, you could see the gate behind, you could see the exit, and say, yep, that works. And then we could move on and move on to model making. We then also had a concept artist that just talked about colours, because we, we obviously we hadn't thought about that yet. We then started prototype buildings and making decisions about paint textures and you know, how can we make the roof look real, and everything like that. And that, this answered a lot of questions that would go on for further models. We then, um, we, this was us making the final, final thing. We used lighting, doll's house lighting. Um, we used, um, you know, we wired all these up so it actually lit. So again, this is the final model and this is it all coming together. And then this is how that model sits within the final game. So a reduction in scale plus an increase in scope, made us choose new techniques. One of those techniques was laser cutting. <coughs> Sorry. Um, this was a fantastic process. Um, I don't know if you guys have done laser cutting before, but it's really good fun. We, um, you know, this is it all coming off the laser bed. This is, again, another technique that Katrina brought to us, because um, obviously architects use this kind of technique all the time. Um, came back with this massive jigsaw puzzle of, of mess. And the great thing about this is that we could get really miniature mo models that actually worked. So that pulley is actually able to function in the game. We also used small motors. Again, we were like, how are we going to get a windmill turning? You know, that's how are we going to, you know, get pulleys, get all sorts of things. And... We just Googled microwave motors from Amazon, and um, they span, you know, they spin at the sack speed we wanted. And that's how that looks in the final game. So other techniques we used was stop motion. We had this scene where all these apartments move in and out like this. They, um, they you know, we wanted, again, we were like, do we do pulleys? How are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna make this technique happen? Um, we thought about the only time we use stop motion in luminous. A lot of people think a lot of it's stop motion, but actually it's not. It's all filmed for real. But 
this was one of the oh, this is the only scene we did use stop motion and it was great for us um, this is it all coming together and this is how this technique looks in the final I don't even think this is the final game I think it's, we've, we've got it a bit more polished than that but yeah you can see that you know to get that technique stop motion was the only way really um, metal work was another really fun thing uh, the co-founder Luke's dad is a um, jewellery maker so you know Luke's always been looking for a project to work with his dad on but you know game designer jewellery maker how could they come together and um, his dad made this Uh oh. What does that mean? Well, if, if you saw, just surface beginning to very slightly blister. Mm. Yeah, it looks good. Well, it'll hammer out. So yeah. thing that Daryl was making there was an Airstream caravan. Um, like I said, Luke always want, you know, this was a lovely collaborative moment. Um, again, working with people not in the computer industry at all. Um, and this is how that sits in the final scene. So again, it gives us a real, you know, we couldn't get the shadows and the, the brushed aluminium any other way than actually doing it for real. So motion control cameras was another major thing. Um, we had this rig for one day to film all the in, um, exterior shots. So I'll just show you a quick video of that day. time but um yeah and uh sorry i'll go back motion track another technique we used um yeah um so again i'll just show you um quickly how we used this technique with lumi going around um the rotating house so again we filmed that one cycle and then um, we with after effects we tracked her onto that um that button and she swings around with it so, just quickly, um, the cons of making a game like this. It takes three years and counting. It's four years now, actually. Um, every scene needs bespoke treatment. You know, every, every animation, every model is completely unique. So, you know, there was, there's nothing we can really repeat with this. We had to memorize the entire game for one day's filming. You can't change anything after you've filmed it. You might get a scalpel in the foot, as someone nearly did here. Um, a dog might try and eat your game. Again, this actually happened. We were carrying the models to the TV studio um, to be filmed, and um, dog got quite interested in the gatehouse. Um, so I'm, I'm just, yeah, so I've talked a lot about the cons and why it's tricky, but at the same time, we love this game, you know. On day 900, we were working on it, we still, you know, really um, were passionate about it. And it was, you know, to wake up on a Monday morning and be excited. And no, no, you know, no day was the same. We were, like, solving problems on the fly. And I had a really lovely creative buzz about it throughout production. And this was decisions we had to make on year one that we had to stick with by year four. You know, this type of... Production is, is, is tricky, um, but at the same time, those decisions were the right decisions, so it all worked out um, well in the end. But I'm just going to show the current trailer for you to take a look.
So since we've launched, luckily people recognise the hard work and determination we had, and we've been lucky enough to win some, some really fantastic awards. Uh, I'd just like to say it's coming out very, very soon on iOS, so look out for it in the next few weeks. Android's in the making. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you. So that's my presentation. Thank you. That's all right, I can hear you. <laughs> I love the style. Uh, Lovely. It's great. Um, would you like recommend other p other people to like look at this kind of way you've done your game? Yeah. Would you Would you recommend that? Because it's yeah, really it's unique. really it's really hard to say because for us it was we did it because that's what we played to our strengths. Our strengths were like the you know the sketching and the model making, and it's something we love doing. So for me to be faced with a three D rendered you know, software, I'm a bit like, oh, I don't know where to start. But for us, it was. And I, I would recommend it because we loved it. And, there's, and also, there's a warmth to it that I think people have picked up everywhere. And it's the only, you know, you can, we feel, I feel like the only way you can get that is the way we did, we made the game. So um, I think it free, you know, getting away from the screen and doing something different frees up lots of creative, in creative, challenges you know um so i would re i personally would recommend it right Kath, i'm just going to move you slightly oh, over sorry. here sorry so we move you over here so who's the next question over here oh hang on let's just go here first um you mentioned that you use laser cutting uh, is yeah. that the only method you use to like uh, CAD at all? Like I'm guessing because for laser cutting you have to use basically like, 3D and stuff, and you cut it out through a laser. Cut. Is that the only method of 3D that you used, or was it um, any other? Well, no, that was that was all done in Illustrator. We didn't it was all even done in we didn't. Yeah, it was like flat planes, so it wasn't even 3D modeled. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Is that yeah? No, so we didn't. We just had a we just had lots of flat. You know. Did you go through that process yourself, or did you hire someone to do it for you? Um, we did what the, the illustrator, actual, the, yeah, the, the card and that was putting it on the laser machine. Um, that was someone uh, Katrina did that for us, okay. the um, using illustrator to do that. And um, we obviously went and hired laser cutting machines, we don't, we don't have them yeah. in house, <laughs> love to, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. You said that at year one you had to make some decisions and you had to stick with it, yeah, you haven't made the wrong ones. Everyone asked that, um. No, not really, no. There was the odd thing where, <clears throat> the one thing for us, um, the way it was built, it was very bespoke, which is great, you know, everything's really creative, but at the same time, the time after we filmed everything, we thought the animation would be like, yeah, just put the animation on top. Didn't work like that, because every, you know, every ladder is a slightly different size. Every, so all Lumi's walking cycles had to be different. And I think, um, it's not that was a frustration, but, e but equally, you, the player gets a really bespoke, you know. For us, it was harder work, but the end result meant everything was really, you know, bespoke animation. And I'm, maybe if we made a game again, I think we'd sort of take that more into consideration. You know, standardise a few more things to make it easier for us in the long run. It's obviously nearly done, but... It's, uh, sorry, I've, I forgot to add that. It is already out on PC oh, and Mac, on yeah, on Steam. Right. Um, uh, so it's out on iOS very soon. Future projects? I mean, would you do this again? Um, I think in terms of Luminosity and Loom, like, I think we've said everything we need to say of Lumi and this story. Um, but, and I equally, we are starting the next big project. And um, I can't imagine a game where we don't make anything handmade again, but we'll have to see, so yeah. Can you give us any details? Or no, it's really early oh. days. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Who, other questions? Is the plan to stick with video games or has anyone approached you to do a kind of large animation? Um, <clears throat> well, nobody, we have, we have come from animation, so it's not something we are, um, 
I'm familiar with, but I feel like the team we've got at the moment and the way we're making video games, you know, I wouldn't, I think it's really exciting. So, um, n never say never to anything. That's my, my motto. So, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, just a bit of curiosity. How long did it actually take you to put Q uh, Luminous City together? Like that, because it's obviously one like uh, r real world assets. How long did it actually take you to put it together for the shooting? Oh, the the, sh the actual city. Like, okay, so the so we started the the models were probably a year to make, and then yeah. we had the studio for like. Um, two or three weeks to put just to put it together so yeah. that was literally like carrying it from our studio to the tv studio and putting it all together and making it all feel um lit correctly like you know the lighting on luminous yeah. it was really important so we wanted that so i think but then that was only the exterior models and then all the interiors on um, we did after that day yeah. so that was like year one and then year two was more models and animation year three was who knows i don't know more animation yeah. um and then, and then in the last year, since we launched in December, we've been doing the iOS port, yeah. so. We've got one last question. Who's got a burning question? There is no one last question. Oh, hang on, Mike. How did you fund it? Um, um, was there any problems fund funding something? <laughs> That was so kind of uh, unusual. So we've we've run we've been state of play has been going since two thousand and eight. So effectively, when we made Loom, it was from like the savings we'd made before in the company. Um, Loom again was a proof of concept, so that enabled us to fund like the first part of making Loom Low City. And then halfway through, we kind of was running out of funds. Went to um, um, a, a investor. While we were making Lumino City, we were also having Google Fridays, where every Friday we'd work on something completely different. And that was a game called Kami. Um, and at that point, where we were kind of running out of money, we launched Kami, and the investor said, I don't think you'll need our money, launch this game. Luckily, Kami paid for the rest of the development. So that's how it's happened. Cool. Okay, thank you very much, Kath. That was a brilliant lecture. Um, give a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you.